with us. We're very happy that you can be among us tonight. I think your presence here speaks of your interest in spiritual things, your desire to honor God, recognize that you have an obligation and a privilege to do that, and that's why we're here, to honor Him, to learn of His Word, and uh, it's good that we can be together tonight to do just exactly that. If you came hungry tonight, that's good, because we're going to talk about uh, something that will help fill you spiritually. How about that for an introduction? I mentioned the topic of fasting in a sermon several weeks ago, uh, just sort of in passing. And after that, I actually had two or three people come up to me uh, and say something like, you know, I, I never have heard much on fasting or never heard a lesson on that or I'd like to have more study on that. And so uh, I gave that some thought and I thought it might be good that we study fasting together tonight. And I hope that you will find this uh, spiritually filling, let's say, and you'll find something in this that will help you grow in your connection to God and in your spiritual strength. Fasting, in the biblical sense, is the abstaining from food and drink or drink for a spiritual reason. In the Old Testament, uh, Jews fasted quite often, apparently, though by Old Testament law, there was actually only one fast that was prescribed, and, and you kind of have to read carefully even to get that. You might notice in Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 31, that on the Day of Atonement, there, the instruction was that they afflict their souls. It doesn't say fast specifically, but you go over to Isaiah chapter 58 and verse 3, and in connection with afflicting one's soul, you have fasting. So most Old Testament scholars believe that there was a command there, really, to fast on the Day of Atonement. But other than that, the Jews were not commanded to fast, but many of them did. And you read about that throughout Old Testament times, people fasting, again, abstaining from food or drink for a spiritual reason. There are no compulsory fasts at all required of Christians today. But as we'll see in our lesson tonight, the New Testament sort of takes for granted that children of God are going to see the need to fast, at least occasionally, and that they'll benefit from that experience when they do. And that's really where the lesson's coming from tonight. I'm not trying to, to bind anything or say, here's something you must do and you have to do it now. But I want you to look at, ultimately, what the New Testament has to say about fasting and how it might help you in your life and in your walk with God. In Luke chapter 5 and verse 35, when the Lord's disciples were criticized for not fasting, Jesus responded basically by suggesting that it was hardly appropriate for them to fast while he was yet with them. But the time would come, however, when he would be taken away from them, and then they would fast. So again, there's not really a command there, but there is a statement, and a statement authorizes, doesn't it? And it indicates that Jesus will would be that his disciples fast after he's taken away from them, ascends back to the Father. Fasting is not something that we engage in out of compulsion or ritual formality. It's something that's done at the discretion of a Christian or of Christians to help them. And it's to be done when motivated by an intense need or desire for the spiritual benefits that it provides. I'm going to break the lesson up tonight up into basically four sections. And the first of them has to do with occasions of fasting in the Bible. Why did people fast? And I'll just go through some examples of fasting and notice the reasons that people had for engaging in this activity. I think one of the most obvious reasons when you look at fasting for doing it is in times of loss, mourning, personal sor sorrow. I've known people, uh, you know, somebody passes away and the first thing we do in the South especially is take them food. And, the, you know, just often uh, buckets full of food are, are brought to people's. And most, most of the time when people who are in sorrow, they don't feel like eating. Uh, and, and, you know, somebody will say to some you know, the, the, the widow of somebody who's passed away, well, you need to eat. Well, I don't feel like eating. And, and so this sort of fasting is almost a natural thing. When, when you're in sorrow, when you're mourning, 
when you're emotionally upset. A lot of people don't feel like eating. But it's more than that, and I want you to understand that. It's just not a matter of, well, I don't feel like eating now. But people engage purposely in the abstention from food and abstaining from food in order to help them through this period, this period of mourning. And, and you see it not only as a help to them, but also as something that marks the, the, the significance of, of an event of sadness. Um, you think of things that tragedies that have happened in America, the 9-11 tragedy. And, and, you know, flags flew at half staff and, and so on and so forth. And there were things that are done. There are things that are done to remember that, that are sobering and, and, and somber. A, a fast is also that at a sad occasion. So as you go through the Old Testament, you might look at 2 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 12. Saul, King Saul and Jonathan had been killed. And it says there that David and all the men that were with him mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan. So here's the loss of a king. And people mourn and they weep and they fast. In Judges chapter 20 and verse 26, there was a battle going on, sort of almost a civil war type thing between uh, the tribes of Israel and, and Benjamin. And Israel fasted and wept that day after 22,000 people had been lost in battle against that tribe of Benjamin. It says they fasted that day until evening. So those are the kinds of occasions, and there are many more actually of those that we could look at in the Old Testament. And then people fasted in connection with earnest prayer regarding very deep concerns. Here, here's something, of course we pray always or we should, we pray often, but maybe here's something that we're especially deeply concerned about. And, and people would engage in fasting to accompany those kinds of prayers. In the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah opens up with Nehemiah getting some news, the book opens up with Nehemiah getting some news from Jerusalem, from the homeland, that things were not going well there with the, the people who had returned. The nation of Israel was not well established. It was not secure. He gets some bad news about the condition of the city and its walls and all of that. And, and it, it, it moves him deeply. It disturbs him very much. And it, he says in Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 4, that I mourned for many days and I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Here's just one of many, many places in the Bible where fasting and praying are connected together. They're very often mentioned together that somebody's involved in, in a prayer where they're just so concerned about something, and then fasting will be mentioned in connection with that. In 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 16, another well-known occasion of this, you remember that David had sinned with Bathsheba, and Bathsheba was with child and had a child, and, and, and God basically said that the child, as a result of your sin, the child's going to die. And the text tells us in 2 Samuel 12 and verse 16 that David fasted and prayed that the child not die, that he pleaded with the Lord. Of course, the child, in fact, did die. When you go over to the New Testament, Saul of Tarsus travels the road to Damascus, and he has this overwhelming experience. The Lord speaks to him, the bright light shines, and he is blinded, and he's led into Damascus. And the text tells us there in this time when he suddenly realized in his life that he's been on the wrong side, he's been persecuting Christians, and in fact, Christ is Lord. He's come to understand that through the Lord appearing to him on the road to Damascus. And the text tells us in Acts chapter 9 and verse 9, and also if you look in verse 11, that he did not eat or drink for three days. So here's a three-day fast, and it says in connection with that that he was praying in verse 11. So Paul fasted and prayed for three days. Obviously, he's He's very deeply concerned about his life, about the direction that he's taken and what the direction he should take in the future. And so he's fasting and he's praying along with that. Well, those are some examples of occasions of fasting in the Bible. You also have fasting in connection with confession of sin and repentance. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 9 as a rather classic example of this kind of thing. And as you're turning there, let me just notice with you that in Bible times, people who were right with God were upset with their sins. They didn't have the attitude that so many of us have today. Well, 
I, I committed a sin. That's one on me. My bad. And just sort of go, go on. But, but people who sinned and realized that they had violated God's law and offended Him, they were upset by that. And fasting would often coincide with the confession of those sins. I mean, they were upset with their sin. And as they prayed and confessed regarding their sins, they would often fast as well. And that's what you have in Nehemiah chapter 9. Look at verse 1. On the 24th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting in sackcloth and with dust on their heads. And all of that has to go with an uh, outward expression of, of humility, throwing dust on your head and dressing in sackcloth and poor clothing. The next verse says, Then those of Israelite lineage separated themselves from all the foreigners, and they stood and confessed their sins and their iniquity and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in the place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for one-fourth of the day. And the text goes on and talks about that experience, but it starts out with them mourning, fasting, confessing. They were upset about their spiritual condition, and so much so that it led to this very heartfelt fast on this occasion. In 1 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 6, Samuel had rebuked the Israelites for idolatry. And the text there says that they gathered together at Mizpah and drew water, and they poured it out before the Lord, and they fasted that day and said, Here we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mizpah. Uh, the idea of taking the water and pouring it out before the Lord uh, appears to be something like a drink offering where you have water to drink. It's not that you don't have water to drink or food to eat, but it's that you poured, they poured that out before the Lord and basically said, we're not eating and drinking today because of the sin that we've committed. And they wanted to be right with the Lord. and They wanted to confess that before him. And that's a very interesting reading, I think, there in 1 Samuel chapter 7, how they reacted. You might remember talking about reactions when Jonah was commissioned to go to Nineveh and preached to it. He, he wasn't very willing to do that at first and had some experience uh, fishing, not so much being the one catching the fish, but being the bait, uh, you know, had some experience with that. And it, it, it eventually he decided he needed to go to Nineveh and preach. And he preached to them that they needed to, re to repent. And in the book of Jonah, chapter 3 and verse 5, it tells us that the people of Nineveh proclaimed a fast when they were brought to the recognition of their sins, the tragedy that God had planned for them if they didn't repent. So they were uh, so concerned about that that they proclaimed the fast. And then, just on occasions of special significance and importance for the people of God, there would be fasts in Bible times. Moses fasted during the period when he was receiving the law. In Exodus chapter 34 and verse 28, we're told that. You remember during the reign of Queen Esther that an edict was signed basically uh, authorizing the annihilation of all of the Jews in Persia. And when it was brought to her attention that that was done and uh, her kinsman Mordecai suggested she needed to do something about it, she requested that the Jews pray and fast for three days on her behalf in Esther chapter 4 and verse 16. When you turn to the New Testament in Acts chapter 13, you notice that the church in Antioch is about to send out Paul and Barnabas on that first perilous evangelistic journey. And verses 2 and 3 says that as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And having fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and they sent them away. What you see in all of these occasions, and, and the thread to me that run that similar, somebody says, well, these seem to be disconnected to me. No, I think they're very connected. What was going on on Sinai was Moses is getting the law. Here, here is the law of God coming to God's people. What a momentous occasion. What a, what a proper and appropriate time to fast. 
In Esther's time, the people of God were threatened with annihilation. What an appropriate time to fast. Such an important event to the people of God that they overcome this by God's power. In the days of the early church, think about the sending out of Paul and Barnabas on this journey and the momentous results of their work and their quest. And on all of these occasions, what you have is fasting. That's the thread that runs through all of those. And, and so that's why I say I think besides the things we've already mentioned, also there were these events of great significance to the people of God. In chapter 13 and verse 23, um, 14 to verse 23, I'm sorry, that's wrong on the screen. When elders were appointed, they prayed with fasting and commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Acts 14 and verse 23. So those are some of the occasions of fasting in, in the Bible. Well, how long do you have to fast? That, that question is very practical. It often comes up uh, when people are first beginning to study this especially. How long should a fast be? And the answer surprises uh, folks at first, I think. You might think of these 40-day fasts, and of course that would be uh, a, very, a very extended fast and, and take a, a lot of focus and concentration and probably take a person away completely from their day-to-day -day life and their day-to-day -day responsibilities otherwise. So that would be very, very involved. And when people think of fasting, they, they think, well, oh, I've got to go without food for 40 days, and I, I just don't think I can do that. Well, there are other kinds of fasts and other durations of fasts in Scripture. The longest fasts were 40 days. Moses fasted for 40 days in Exodus 34. Elijah went for 40 days on the strength of the food that an angel had given him. So the implication there is that he fasted during that time for those 40 days. And then Jesus Christ. It's interesting, these three individuals, Moses, Elijah, and Jesus, fasted for 40 days. They're the three individuals that fasted for 40 days. The law, the prophets, and the Savior, the Messiah. The ones who are there on the Mount of Transfiguration. Same people, right? These are the ones who fasted for 40 days. But other than that, you have uh, fasts of varying duration throughout the Scriptures. Um, in 1 Samuel 31, you have a fast that lasts for seven days when... Uh, Saul's bones are taken and actually taken back from the Philistines and buried. And there's a fast that occurs for seven days on that occasion. The fast that we mentioned that occurred in, in Esther's time was a three-day fast. And then you come to a passage like Ezra chapter 9 and verse 5. Ezra learned about the sin that had been going on in Israel where the Israelites had intermarried with foreigners. And he was very upset by it. But it, it says that he... He fasted till evening. I don't know when he started, what time of day he started. But if it was after lunch, that's not a very long fast, right? But he fasted till evening, is all we're told there. And also in Judges chapter 20 and verse 26, Israel fasted that day, that we've already mentioned that, till evening. When Daniel is thrown into the lion's den in Daniel chapter 6, Darius the king fasts that night it says. Well, most of us fast at night. I, I don't know, there may be some midnight snackers here, I don't know, but most of us don't eat at night. And if some of you, I think, are like me in that you're up about half the night anyway, but I, I don't eat when I'm up. But there in, in Daniel chapter 6 and verse 18, he, he purposely fasted, abstained from food out of his concern for Daniel in the lion's den. So what I get out of that, and I hope you see it too, is that a fast doesn't need to be especially prolonged, it can be, and it might depend on the occasion of the fast. But even just uh, saying, well, I'm not going to eat lunch today, or I'm going to fast from morning till evening, those would be acceptable fasts. Even saying, well, I'm not going to have, have my mid-morning snack, or, or something like that, that I might devote myself to, to prayer, or, or something along that line, or because something is concerning me, and I'm just going to abstain from food for this particular period of time. That, that's fine. And that's what you see in Scripture, all sorts of durations from just a, a very few hours perhaps to, to 40 days, depending on the purpose, depending on uh, the need at the moment. When you look at that, I think most of us would say, well, you know, that's something I could do. I, I could incorporate that into my life. And I think if right now you'll decide to do that, 
you'll find it to be very beneficial to you. Let me just challenge you there and, and say that if you'll, if you'll think right now that here's something I can try to do. I don't have to go 20 days without food, but here's something I, I can try to do for a, a period of time. And here are some of the key components that I see revealed in Scripture when we're fasting. The first of them is humility. Fasting should flow from the deepest sense of who one is before God. To see oneself as God sees. And to humble yourself, to prostrate your heart before the God of heaven. It's something that comes out of a humble heart. But let me warn you about this. Anything where God is trying to encourage us to humility, Satan will try to encourage us to pride. And at every point where God exhorts us to humble service, Satan will try to twist that to make us proud of it. You remember, just last, last week, we talked about the greatest fault, not being able to see our faults, and that, that Pharisee that stood up in the temple in the Gospel of Luke, and he said, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I, what's the first thing he says? I fast twice in a week. I'm proud. And so the very thing that's to help us understand who we are before God and to bring us to a humble position before God and, and confess our reliance upon Him, the very thing that we're, the action that we're to do to help us with that is, is what Satan had tempted that Pharisee with and he was proud of it. Isn't that something? And so I would caution you to look at your heart in practicing this and make sure you're doing it for the right reason. The second key component is sincerity. Fasting is not just a physical exercise without spiritual purpose. If you're going without food just to go without food, that's dieting. That's not fasting. Okay, different thing. Fasting has a spiritual purpose. In Zechariah chapter 7, in verses 4 through 10, Zechariah tells of the Israelites fasting not for God, but for themselves. Their fasting had turned into a religious ritual without any attention paid to God. So God says to them, dispense true justice and practice kindness and compassion each to his brother. And do not oppress the widow or the orphan, the stranger or the poor. And do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. You see, what had happened is that they boiled fasting down to just a physical practice that had no spiritual significance. Just like a lot of people do assembling in worship nowadays. Oh, we, I went to church. You know, I went to church, therefore I've done what God expects me to do this week. That's the way a lot of people think. They went to church, but was God honored? Were sins forgiven? Was holiness encouraged? Am I living out that out in my life? And see, fasting is the same way. If I'm going to engage in fasting, it's not just a ritual. It's, just not, it's not something I'm just going to go through or have to go through. It's something I want to do to improve myself spiritually. The Scriptures more than suggest that God honors fasting and appreciates it when it is a token of and coincides with sincere and unselfish dedication to Him. On the other hand, God rather despises fasting when it's done by hypocrites. Please turn in your Bibles over to Isaiah chapter 58. And read several verses with me now. Isaiah 58, starting in verse 3. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? 
Why have we afflicted our souls and you have taken no notice? So here are people, they've been fasting, they've been praying to God, they've been afflicting their souls, and yet God seemed to be paying them no never mind, as we say. they just not granting their requests. And they're asking this question, why? We fasted, we've afflicted our souls. Why is it that we're not getting anywhere with you, God? And here's the response. He says, in fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate and to strike with the fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. You see what God's saying? You've, you've, you've fasted, but you've not been living holy lives. You, on the day of your fast, you engage in pleasure and, and you're not spiritually focused. And then you, you go out and, and you're unjust in your dealings with people and, and you're not honorable in the way you're behaving. That's not a fast that's going to work with me is what God is saying. He says in verse 5, Is it a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? They've been doing all of this stuff that appeared to be fasting, but their souls were not really in it. Their hearts were not in it. And so here's what God says to them in verse 6. He says, is this not the fast that I've chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break up every yoke is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out when you see the naked that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh? I want to stop there and just notice the connection of that to the sermon this morning. Are you noticing that? What would be a good thing to go along with fasting? How about while you're fasting, go help somebody in need? You do without, and maybe for the very purpose, so that somebody else might have. That's what's being described here. And in verse 9, Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. God wants humility. He wants sincerity in fasting. Jesus' instructions about it in Matthew chapter 6 are just exactly along that line. Don't fast to be seen of men. It's, it's not something you do for show. It, it's, it's like praying. It may be that other people know about it or might need to know about it. Somebody that's cooking your meals, for instance, if you're a man and your wife cooks your meals, she might need to know if you're fasting. But you don't do it to be seen of men. There were people in Jesus' day who disfigured their faces and went about, oh, you know, I'm fasting today, just sort of announced it everywhere they went so that they would appear to be holy. That's not what fasting's about. It's much, much deeper and more sincere than that. And the other thing about fasting is with it go, comes intensity. We were talking this morning about with fervency serving the Lord, with a passion within us that's boiling. And I believe that what you see throughout Scripture is when people fasted, there, there was an intensity of spirit. They were wholly, completely involved in a spiritual concern when they fasted. They gave themselves completely to what it is that they were focused on. And it was the fast coinciding with that that indicated the intensity of the experience. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote about fasting. He says, when the flesh is satisfied, it's hard to pray with cheerfulness or to devote oneself to a life of service which calls for so much self-renunciation. And Wesley Durd says that fasting in the biblical sense is choosing not to partake of food because your spiritual hunger is so deep your determination and intercession is so intense or your spiritual warfare so demanding that you have temporarily set aside even fleshly needs to give yourself to prayer and meditation. I think that's a very good description of biblical fasting. What it means and what it is. There's an intensity to it. And why I'm recommending it tonight, and I think why the Bible recommends it, 
is because there is an intensity to it, it helps you be more intense yourself. It helps you find that place. I've talked with people. I've had the same experience myself, but have you had this experience? I just don't, I don't feel as spiritual. I, I don't feel as, as connected to God. I've had young people come up to me and say, I, I just don't feel as spiritually connected or in tune with God as I ought to be. I feel like I'm, I'm just sort of dull or something like that. Can I suggest when you're feeling like that, try fasting? Because it helps you become more intense in your spiritual endeavors and pursuits and interests. Well, that brings us to the last few moments of our lesson tonight. And I want to talk about fasting in the lives of Christians today. I know I've suggested several things as we've gone through the material already. But think about these things with me as far as the application of this lesson. First of all, fasting in the lives of Christians today is definitely authorized. We've seen that in several scriptures already. If nothing else, the Apostle Paul did it. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 5, 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 27, says he was in fastings often. So he often fasted. Last I checked, apostolic example authorizes. So by apostolic example, we are authorized to fast. There's no doubt about that. Secondly, Jesus' teaching, as we said at the beginning of the lesson, assumed that his disciples would fast. We saw that in Matthew 6. When you fast, do it in secret, Jesus says. When you fast. And we've seen already that the early disciples fasted individually and collectively. We noticed in Acts chapter 13, with the sending away of Paul and Barnabas, in Acts chapter 14, with the appointment of elders, apparently uh, more than one individual fasted there, in 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 5, a married part, a man and woman, husband and wife, might deprive one another from the, the, their uh, relationship for a time, for prayer and fasting, the text says. And so it was definitely practiced by Jesus' disciples, and as Jesus assumed that it would be. Now, fasting can be a source of spiritual blessing and, and power. And that's what the Bible recommends to us about it. It's a way to seek a closer relationship with God, to focus our mind on spiritual pursuits. Maybe we're praying and we're looking for an answer from God and it's really important to us. It'd be a good time to fast. Maybe we need wisdom to make an important decision that's going to affect our lives, perhaps the lives of other Christians. It'd be a good time to fast. Maybe we want to express sorrow or humility before God to confess a sin or sins. Maybe we're praying about a worry or concern that we've had and we want to lay that over to God and let Him have that care and that concern. And it's just been eating us up inside. It'd be a good time to fast and just turn that over to Him in prayer and let Him have that to avoid a disaster which only God can change the outcome of. Fasting, I think, also goes along with encouraging others in their service. When elders were appointed, when preachers were sent out, there was fasting and prayer that went along with that. The purpose of fasting is to loosen to some degree the ties which bind us to the world of material things and our surroundings as a whole in order that we might concentrate all our spiritual powers upon the unseen and eternal things. That's what it's about. It can be done individually. It can be done collectively. If a, and I, I would take, again, I think there's no compulsion here, but just as we, we request of one another prayers, I think it would be appropriate to request of one another fasting and prayers. Just as a request, not something somebody has to do necessarily, but it would be appropriate to request that. John Chrysostom said that fasting of the body is food for the soul. And I think that's a wonderful thought. You see, we want to feed our souls, don't we? Be strong in spirit 
and fasting can help us accomplish that. Ultimately, the food for the soul is Jesus Christ, who described himself in John chapter 6 as the bread of life who came down from heaven. He came and he wants you to take him into you. As he says in that chapter, to feed on his flesh and on his blood. To have him become part of you. To have him energize your life and be what keeps you going in this world. Jesus, the bread of life, should be your food. And if he is your food, maybe sometimes things like physical food and other physical things, maybe they won't be that important. Well, tonight, is he? Is Jesus your food? Is he your bread of life? Is he what's most important to you? And if he's not, you have an opportunity right here and now to make him your Savior and Lord, confess his name, be baptized in water for the remission of sin.